It's a real pleasure to be speaking to Stephen Jennings uh, again. Stephen, thanks for making the time for us today. Wonderful to see you again. No, it's and welcome awesome. to Tatu. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I was we, we, we drove all the way down from Nairobi, and it's really impressive. And thank you. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll sh we'll show some of that to everybody. Stephen, I just wanted to start by just asking a little bit about your background. There's some people who wouldn't know who you are. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit of a synopsis of who Stephen is, where he came from, what's he done? Yeah, I'm a New Zealander. I'm um, an economist by background. I worked in the government on reform. Um, then I went to Central and Eastern Europe. Then I worked in emerging markets in Eastern Europe and Russia and lived there for 20 years. So went through explosive modernization of a post-Soviet economy and saw incredible markets being created from scratch. Um, and then about 15 years ago, I woke up and realized the biggest opportunity in Africa in the world is going to be in Africa. So about 15 years ago we started and gradually we transitioned our focus to Africa and we became over time very big and very committed investors. So tell us a little bit about Africa, you know, 15 years ago, what did you do? Yeah, 15 years ago we started, or even slightly earlier, studying Africa. Um, and if you talk to people who knew Africa well, you spent some time here, you realize this is a story, this is a movie the world had seen before. This was Asia 30 years later. The starting point was very, very similar. Yes. Uh, a lot of people said that it didn't happen in the same way that Asia happened, in the sense that Asia was actually more broad-based than Africa ever was. Yeah, I, d I don't agree with that. I mean, people tend to have a, a stylized view of countries and regions. The fact is that the, the growth in Asia, you had the Asian tigers, and at the, initially you had economies that underperformed for a very long time, the Philippines, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, for example, big economies. And some of those had expected, because of the foreign involvement, to be the success stories, but they were the laggards, Indonesia. Um, now, th some of those countries are catching up. Some of those are the fastest growing economies in the world, but that wasn't the case 35 years ago. So we're experiencing the same thing in Africa. There's a tidal movement of change but it's not perfectly synchronized across countries. So you see this replay again of, of what, you, what you've seen happen in Asia. Um, you, you, you look to position. How do you position into this sort of secular move that, you, you, that you're predicting? Yeah, so the fact is economists and analysts don't know very much about growth. So when you boil it down to empirical evidence and hard data, there's nothing very predictive. Yeah. But one thing we know is that growth tends to be regional in nature. So we're, we're going through a regional transformation. It's not synchronized, but across Asia, we have this move towards pluralism and democracy. We've gone from one democratic country to around 30. Um, we've got improved governance. We've got rising middle class. We've got improving infrastructure, dramatically improving health statistics, education, enrollment. From a low base, it happened gradually, but it's happening continuously. Um, and that creates fabulous investment opportunities. And we're really looking for investment opportunities that are leveraged off and tailored to the precise dynamics of the changes in Africa. And they, they are really about modernization, urbanization, rising population, and the need for much better infrastructure. And in a way, that's our businesses are trying to find the, ex the intersection of those themes. So you, you're Africa wide today. I mean, Tatu, we're here in, in Nairobi, just outside the outskirts of Nairobi in Tatu City, but you've got a, a few of these projects on the go at the yes. same time. Can you just tell us about that, the scope of that? So we've got seven uh, city scale or semi city scale projects in five countries. So Lusaka here, which really is our flagship project. Uh, we're in Lubumbashi in the DRC two projects in Nigeria and two projects in Kenya. And obviously people always say Africa's 50 countries, it's a tautology, yes there are big differences, but if you're building a road or a water system or doing urban planning, the issues are very similar from project to project. So the fact that we're doing multiple projects gives us a huge opportunity to learn and exchange lessons and have a degree of experience that single country operators really can't have. Tell us a little bit about Tartu because obviously it's had quite a history. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of been a, a, a soap opera drama, I think, in the way to describe it. What, how would you describe, you know, give us your perspective on, what, on, on Tartu and, and its evolution to where we are today. 
after we bought 5,000 hectares of coffee estates off Sokfenef. A, uh, this was all coffee? The whole, yeah, and a number of other estates. Um, it had been in their hands going back to the 60s. So the, the ownership was, was excellent. How would I describe it? This is the biggest and most exciting new city and urban development in Africa. Um, so we have a full mixed use, mixed income development. We're about nine years into it. And all those modules are really blossoming. It's a lot of work to get to critical mass and to get to a stage where you have proof of concept and market belief. But anyone visiting the project today sees we have the biggest industrial park in East Africa. They see that we have a thousand children coming to school and new schools. The number of new schools opening will be at 2,000 pupils a day by the end of next year. 5,000 pupils a couple of years after that. They'll see that there's about 5,000 residential uh, units being constructed or in process. Uh, they'll see that there's five to 10,000 affordable residential units being planned and many of the other ingredients um, that go into a city. So the only class A warehousing in East Africa, 50,000 square meters, uh, is just down the road and it opens in, in September, for example. Let me ask you, uh, put it to you differently. So you've made, I mean, probably if you look at it from an FDI perspective, it's probably the single biggest FDI investment I would have thought in this region uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and you've had quite a journey over that period. Uh, I know you've been used to frontier markets. Uh, we, we met in Moscow a few times. I mean, that is the, a rough and tumble market, I'm sure. What would be the less, what, what, you know, describe us the, the journey, the challenges. You know, we were talking earlier that uh, about, you know, an analyst sitting in London doesn't understand what, what it really takes to yes. operate on the ground here, right? In overall, we've had a very good experience. Yeah. Obviously, when you put a drain in the ground or you um, build a classroom in a school, it doesn't normally get into the newspaper. When you have legal issues or other problems, it gets a lot of media attention. But the fact is, from the very beginning, the support from first the people who want to develop on our land, then the utilities, uh, the governor of Kiambu County, and many other people we've had, the support has been absolutely fabulous, which is why we have a billion dollars of new industrial investment, why we have all these other uh, developments. And what are the lessons? They're obvious in a, in a way. You have to be very committed and you have to have a long time, time frame. And you need to design your organisation for this environment. This environment isn't going to adapt to you. You have to adapt your organisation, all aspects of it, to the realities of, of operating successfully here. You know, when I was looking at it and thinking about it, and uh, you know, in the last uh, year, it's been a tsunami of new people moving in, investments. You know, we can name the African logistics, the schools. These are very premier brands, kind of now being crowded in and looking. If you at look at the industrial players, it's the Unilevers, <coughs> uh, the Chandarias, the Kimfes, the Coopers, the K Brands, the Maxims. Um, we've just done a deal with a major South African multinational, which will announce. A uh, major new housing project will announce tomorrow. Yeah, so they're premier, they're the market leaders who are redefining how industry is undertaken. They're building global scale, global quality plants to go out and, and attack the whole East African or even African region. So definitely that's my sense and uh, you know the sense is that you've crossed whatever tipping point there yes. might have been some time ago. But, you know, of late we've seen a, a couple of issues come up, a court case with a few people. Do you want to just tell us about that and how you how you view some of this sort of what I would call vexatious litigation or, or how would you term it? Yeah, I think when you build something this big and this valuable um, in a market like Kenya, uh, where institutions are still developing, um, where there's a degree of criminalised activity, um, you are going to have people who will try and extort you. They see you as a soft touch. They think, here's some outsiders. Yeah. We're going to hit these guys up. I'll take some land off them. I'll be a nuisance. I'll slow them down. And they'll pay me off and I'll go away. And then somebody else will come and do the same thing. Well, we've seen that game before. Um, three of the Kenyans who were involved in the project um, tried that game. Um, we've fought them in the courts very successfully. We've fought them in other avenues. 
Um, it's cost them a lot of money. It's damaged their reputations. And I think we've shown very clearly, fight your corner. Don't give in to extortionists. Be very public about it. Um, and if, stick, if you stick to your guns, you'll be successful. And what would the lesson be to the country? I mean, to African countries who want to attract this sort of scale of investment that you've made. I mean, you are, you are, you are a pioneer in this space, right? You, in a way, it's in your DNA to make those investments. But if you were sitting on the other side of the fence and you were advising, you know, the biggest challenge to me seems to be they've got to create jobs and you can't create jobs without industrialization. What advice would you be giving to the African heads of state to make it more attractive to, for people like you to come in? So we don't believe in magic wands or simple top-down solutions. The process that Africa's going through, that Kenya's going through, it's an evolutionary process. And it's a domestic and it's an organic process. It's being driven by Kenyans modernizing their own country. Um, and you have to accept that the things that can be done to accelerate that process are quite well known and for us it's all about improving the, the business environment so the fact that Kenya has improved 56 places in ease of doing business in the last three to four years there's no, nothing we would rather see um, we really support we see the benefits and again they're mundane changes that don't make it into the newspaper but taken together they have a huge impact and they gradually change the climate and they gradually reduce the scope for corruption. Um, we'd like to see the same thing in the judicial system. So it's about gradually improving the, the business environment for, for investors. Now you've got investments pretty much across the continent, right? East, West, uh, DRC. Tell us, tell us how the continent looks to you at the moment, looking from those various vantage points. So I, I think, you know, we had the somewhat naive but I still think helpful Africa rising narrative before yeah. the crisis in 2008. Everyone woke up, they realized there's a lot going on in Africa. It was a bit simplistic, but it got people focused. Then in the last few years on the back of the collapse, and it was a historic collapse in oil prices, the oil economies in Africa, as they have elsewhere, have really suffered. And what that's done, it brought the averages down. But if you strip out those oil exporters and you look at the underlying average performance of the rest of Africa, it's, in, it's on, on par with emerging Asia. So very strong. It would it be nice if it was 8% rather than 6%? It would. Oh, yeah. But 55 to 6% growth is high in today's world. So we see average growth rates holding up in a number of countries, Ghana, Kenya, where we're fortunate to be, we see growth accelerating as the reform and the modernization kicks on. But I think in that context, you know, Kenya has just an absolutely fabulous opportunity. Because you, when you look across the continent and you say, where will the big hubs be? Where, where will the, they be? Where will the big commercial centres be? And particularly in light of the travails and the problems in South Africa, where are big businesses going to set up and invest? And you have to say that today, Kenya is very near the top of that list. So if Kenya can, continues with the reforms, the four pillars strategy, the crackdown on corruption, it, it can be at the top of that list. And it's just going to catalyze more and more investment, job creation, and further change and modernization. So I think it's a very exciting time for Kenya. Thanks a Good. lot, Stephen. Thanks, mate. Excellent. Mm -hmm.